Hello guys, this is Mandala on Mandala Loves Jesus. Today I'm going to speak about the topic conscience. We're talking about conscience and this is um, due to the request of a friend of mine in Christ. His name is Constantine. I sent my greetings, Constantine. Let's talk about conscience then, okay? So we're going to talk about what is the definition of conscience here on the left side, definition and we're talking about what the Bible, the King James Bible, tells about the conscience here on the right side. And we talk about the interpretation of it and what it means for our practical life. All right? So let's start with it. We're talking about the, the definition, which is not the definition that is found in the Bible, but it is a definition that is from Webster's Dictionary from the year 1828, which is a dictionary that, uh, in, according to my understanding, is as close as I could found, found, uh, find to the definitions of the biblical words that are in the King James translation. And that's why I used this dictionary to bring a better understanding of the word conscience. Okay, let's start with it then. Conscience means to know, to be private to, and it has different points of definition. First point, internal or self-knowledge or judgment of right and wrong or the faculty power or principle within us which decides on the lawfulness or unlawfulness of our own actions and affections and instantly approves or condemns them. And then it says below here, it names as an example the conviction of the conscience. It says, being convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one, John 8. So this dictionary is using Bible to prove definitions, which is a good sign for a dictionary. And the John 8, it is talking about a woman that is caught in adultery, in, in adulterousness, Adultery, pardon me, that's because of all the Spanish and German, I'm mixing it all up. <laughs> a woman that is caught in adultery and it is brought by the Pharisees before Jesus and they want to test him to see if he is executing the law of Moses, which means to stone this woman to death, right? And they say, uh, Master, we found this woman, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less trying to cite this by my memory, so forgive me if it's not word by word the same thing as the Bible says, but it's basically, they say, Master, we found this woman in plain adultery uh, with our own eyes, and what do you say? Do we kill her? What do we do with her? That's what they want to see, and they are testing him, and he is, in the meantime, while they are accusing her, writing on the ground, or drawing on the ground in the sand, and not really heeding to what they are saying. And then they are insisting and say, what do you say, Master? What are we going to do with her? Moses commanded us to kill her by stoning her to death. And then Jesus says, who, who, is, with, who is without sin, he may throw the first stone, right? And that, that is where John 8 says, being convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one, starting with the elder ones, then going to the younger ones, until everybody has left but Jesus and the woman. And then Jesus is asking the woman, woman, where are thy accusers? If I'm remembering well. And then the woman says, there's nobody left, it's just you and me, Lord. And then he says, they have not condemned you, neither will I. Go and sin no more. That's my resume of what I read there. So, he was the only person that has the right to stone her to death and to throw, throw the first stone on her according to his own requirement, which, which he said is, he who is without sin may throw the first stone. So, he was the one that has fulfilled this requirement, but he had mercy on her and he saved her from her own sins, as this is what the name Jesus means, the Savior that saves us from our own sins, right? 
And even though he had the perfect right before God the Father to execute the commandment of Moses and to kill her, he brought and confronted the wicked people that wanted to condemn her because of her adultery and he brought conviction unto their heart by saying who he who is without sin throw the first stone and then they got convicted one by one then it goes on the conscience manifests itself in the feeling of obligation, the experience which precedes, attends and follows our actions. Conscience is first occupied in ascertaining our duty before we proceed to action. So when the woman uh, was thinking of kissing a man that is not her husband, thinking of breaking the, the holy connection between her and her husband, her conscience is first occupied in ascertaining her duty before she proceeded to action and then in judging our actions when performed. So when she was already in adultery, laying down with the man that is not her husband, her conscience is what judges her and is what also accuses her before the Lord, of course, right? And then in the point two, it says the estimate or determination of conscience is justice, honesty. What you require cannot in conscience be deferred. Then it says in point three, definition, real sentiment, private thought, truth, as do you in conscience believe in the story? Believe the story. Are you 100% sure? Is this according to your best will? how the events passed by. Fourth point of definition, consciousness. Knowledge of our own actions or thought, the sweetest cordial we received at last is conscious of our virtuous actions past. So there you can also abstract that there is a relation on how you are sharpening your conscience and how it how important it is to have a sharp conscience according to our virtuous actions past. Everything that you did in your past that was bringing you closer to God, that helps you to have a more sharpened conscience and to are more conscient of anything that is evil. Point five of the definition says the knowledge of the actions of others. That means your conscience allows you, if it is a healthy conscience, which is a point that will get led later into the detail, to judge the actions of others if it's right or wrong what they do. The conscience enables you to know the difference of what is right and wrong, and it allows you to judge that someone that is killing another person is doing wrong, when he's murdering someone or when someone is violating a child or when someone is um, breaking the laws of God or where someone is lying, right? And that is due to your ability to know the difference between what is right and what is wrong, which, which brings us back to Genesis. There, there is only one thing in our conscience that we are not meant to break one commandment which is we sh shall not eat the fruit in the middle of the garden while we can eat all the other fruits and then the serpent starts to beguile Eve and to tell her you will be like God if you eat the forbidden fruit and you will know the difference be between right and wrong so when Eve and Adam ate from the forbidden fruit, they not only died in the spirit, but also they knew what is right and what is wrong. And before that, the only thing that they knew, knew in according to what is right and what is wrong is that they should not eat the forbidden fruit. But after eating the forbidden fruit, they came, became aware that is where the conscience came into 
a bigger focus in their life, right? This is where they felt guilt the first time. This is where they felt judgment the first time in their existence. But before that, even though they knew that they shall not eat the forbidden fruit, there was no any experience of guilt in their life. 9.6 it says, in ludicrous language it is reason or reasonableness. Alright, so far to the definition, let's go over to scripture, King James Version. Let's read Isaiah 30, 21, where it says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. So here Isaiah the prophet is saying, Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. Are those the physical ears? No, it's not talking about the physical ears. It's talking about hearing a word behind thee, saying, this is right or this is wrong. That is what the prophet is saying here. So, that there is a voice, the voice of your conscience, that tells you that you are doing something very evil or something very wrong when you are lying or when you are stealing or when you are breaking whatever law of the Lord, of the perfect love. All right, so everybody is hearing voices. If your doctor tells you you are crazy when you are hearing voices, I have the news for you that everybody is hearing voices. The question is only, are those voices of Satan or is it the Lord that you are hearing? Are those evil spirits that you are hearing and listening to or is this the Holy Spirit that you are heeding to? There is no other way around it, but everybody is hearing voices. Romans 2.15 tells us, which shew the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. So it talks about that if you are Losing peace, that is because your thoughts are accusing you, right? And when you are retaining peace, that's because your thoughts are excusing one another, right? And this is always true as long as you have a um, healthy conscience, right? But here in Titus 1.15, it tells us, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and, and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Now, if your conscience is defiled, then you are confused of what is right and what is wrong. Um, I find that there are regularly cases where uh, Christians try to eat in a holy way or they have been lost in the world and the lust of food or gluttony and they try to um, fix their eating behaviors and bring them and to sanctify their way to eat. And many times you find that as long as their heart is attached to the lust of food, they find it very hard to find peace. Like they, they eat something and they, they are condemning themselves, or they eat nothing and they feel like that's also wrong or they you know they they are lacking peace all the time they are basically suffering a lot because um, because but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure 
that's the reason why, right? So they they eat whatever they try to choose to be in peace with God, and they cannot have this peace because there is something wrong in them, and that means just that they are defiled, that their conscience is defiled, right? So the key of uh, getting out of this craziness of chaos of a defiled conscience is to stop anything, any actions, any events in your life until you are seeing clearly, you know, and to use scripture to prove or to disprove what you are doing, right? So if, if, if you don't know what's all right to eat or not to eat, then you just need to go through the Bible and, and start figuring out what you should eat or what you should not eat, right? And, and keep it simple and stay to simple food. Um, unto the pure all things are pure. The Bible also tells us that the one that is in the books that wrote Solomon, it is talking to us that blessed is the man that is eating and drinking in peace and in a good conscience because this is his part, right? And here Titus is saying, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And this is what happens to those people. They try to, they do, basically they feel like it doesn't matter what they eat or don't eat. They always feel like in the same state of condemnation. Like if it doesn't make any difference what they eat or don't eat or what they do or don't do, which of course is not true. But you have to battle through this and fasting and praying is a very valid way to get rid of this confusion. I suffered a lot from this confusion and uh, auto-condemnation when it came to food um, like 15 years ago or something and I was condemning myself all the time. I was like I ate too much, I ate too less, and I was uh, felt tortured by not finding the right balance. And I recommend you to just go through the Gospels and read how Jesus is behaving and how he's eating and pray for a balanced um, appetite and pray to Jesus that he may heal you, your appetite, that he may... Uh, give you a healthy rejection to any food that is not good for you and to give you a healthy attraction to anything that your body really needs. And, and stick to Jesus and you will make it. All right, let's go on. In Hebrews 10, 22, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's very deep also. It's talking about bodies washed with pure water, which refers to the baptism of the water. It refers to the hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, which of course is a result from being having our bodies washed with pure water. Having your bodies washed with pure water means that you went through the baptism of water and you have confessed your sins to the Lord and have received the forgiveness and the redemption that your body is bought unto redemption by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross where he spilled and suffered, spilled his blood and suffered for us unto death and received the consequence of our sins. He was killed for our wrongdoing. Um, Jesus was killed for our evil conscience, for your evil conscience, for my evil conscience. That's the reason he received the judgment and the suffering for our evilness. And then in 1 Timothy 1.5 it says, 
Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So it says that the end of commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. That means there is no commandment against charity. There is no law against doing good. There is no law against taking care of the widows. The Bible tells us, I think in the Epistle of James, um, that true religion is to visit the widows and to take care of the orphans. And also it says on another uh, place in Scripture that there is no law against loving your neighbor. There is no law against doing good. There is no law against collecting clothes for the people that don't have clothes so can't afford clothes. There is no law against cooking for the poor. There is no law for serving each other. And that is the core of love, to sacrifice your time and resources to help others. It's not the love that gay parents are promoting in those days, right? Love has nothing to do with bodily lust. It has nothing to do with two men kissing each other. That's not love. That's lust. That's the lust of the flesh. It has nothing to do with collecting clothes for the poor. It, it has nothing to do to sacrifice your resources and your time or to humble yourself or to get rid of your ego to do good to others. Then it says in Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. That's very important when it comes to the conscience also, that you trust in the Lord with all thine heart, not on your own understanding, not on what you think is love, not on what you think is right. That's the reason why Jesus said, Love each other as I have loved you. He's not saying love each other as you think you as what you think is love, right? 1 Timothy 1.19 tells us, Holding faith and a good conscience is very important, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So in the worst case, if you're not holding faith and not holding a good conscience, you're shipwrecking in hell. That's basically the worst case that can happen to you that God will cast you out into outer darkness and there will be gnashing of teeth, as the Lord Jesus says. 1 Peter 3.16 says, Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So if you are having a good conscience, you will shine. You will shine on the day of the judgment because there will be, there will be no fault found in you. Whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed. Who will be ashamed? Your false accusers. Because the false accusers, they will be judged for accusing you falsely. That also means make sure never to accuse someone falsely. You, want, you don't want to be found by God being judged for falsely accusing someone, right? And then it says in Titus 1, 15, Unto the pure all things are pure, as we already said, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but the, even their mind and conscience is defiled, because they have a corrupted conscience. <clears throat> a corrupted conscience is, for instance, when you have um, someone that is promoting masturbation, for instance, and says there's nothing wrong when you masturbate, you know, that's just na natural and you just... You know, like even the doctor tell, tells you that it's good for your prostate or whatever, you know. So, <clears throat> there are people that have their conscience so defiled that they lie to themselves 
and they are justifying the deeds of the lust, like masturbation or like ungodly sex practices with their wife or whatever. And they will try to convince other people also that there is nothing wrong with it because everybody's in agreement and why should God have any problem with that and that? Because they are only focusing on the flesh and they say nobody's hurt, everybody's in, the, in will, willful agreement and there's no problem at all, right? And this is when a man starts to justify what they do instead of heeding what the Lord justifies. And this is basically the end of your soul life when you, um, when you base your lifestyle on what you think is all right instead of, what, instead of seeking what God says is all right. And that's where your conscience is getting sick, corrupted, distorted or defiled, as scripture says here. And that's why in 1 Timothy 4.1 it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Because through all the defile, defiling of the blood of the generations of the latter days, people are more and more seduced by their own flesh and the evilness in our blood is stronger and stronger from every generation. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means that means when you have different generations of people, right? You have one generation of people here and another generation of people here and another generation of people here and let's say this is you and this is your parents and this is your grandfather grandfathers that <coughs> This people, or your grandfather, the people of the former generation, they are sinning. So their blood is getting more defiled, getting more obscure, obscure more darkness. And then they have children. They never repented of their fornications, of the adultery. They lusted after other women without saying anything to her wife. They never confessed it to God. They never confessed it to their wife. They did business to get more money that was not righteous. And that's the case of the majority of people. And then they have children. And the children, they also sin. They have their own sins. And they have the defilement from their grandfathers. So... It's their own sin of obscurity, their own darkness. And it's the darkness from their grandparents, right? And then those, this generation has more children. And that's where you are, let's say. And now you also are sinning. And you have the sins from your fathers and your grandfathers. So you are not only bearing your own wickedness, but also the wickedness of um, the former generations, right? So what was a small dark cloud here in two generations before you was getting a bigger clouds, let's say two clouds, the generation of your fathers, and now there is even more garbage with your own sin life without any clearance with God the Father and with the garbage of your ancestors, right? Something like this. So you see every time you're having more and more darkness until 
we are like walking demons basically and the inspiration let's let's have a look at the inspiration of this person this is the person right third generation where we came from the grandparents and the blood the blood that is circulating through the veins of this person this blood is not clean right this blood is defiled there is poison in this blood there are demons in this blood all right there are demons in this blood and that makes this person tempted to do evil things because the corruption of the blood is very strong so when this person is thinking the inspiration of this person is evil make a minus sign here right evil inspiration because there is so much evil dwelling in the flesh of this person right and of course the conscience is and the inspiration from the side of God is coming through the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost from the outside is trying to conquer this heart, right? It's trying to conquer this mind and this heart of this person, right? But, of course, the Holy Spirit will not work against the free will of the person, right? He will not work against the free will of this person. So if this person is happy, staying in its corruption, staying in the flesh, lusts of the flesh, then the Holy Spirit will take this as a no from the person and just leave this person at some point. <coughs> right? But everybody has a just chance and has his conscience that will be a testi testifying for or against this person when the person stands before the throne of God. And if the conscience is defiled, that is because the person has willfully started to destroy the conscience until it sickened or was empoisoned in a way. Let's talk a little bit more about what is the conscience in an illustrative way, all right? Let's say this is your horizon in your mind. There are things that you are conscious of, right? For instance, someone is hitting your hand, right? Someone is hitting your hand. And it's hurting you right now, right? Well, that's a ugly hand, but there it is. Okay, at least I have the number of fingers correct. Now, this hand is hurting you here. You're conscious of this, all right? But there are things that you're not conscious of, right? For instance, you may try to manipulate other people or to control other people. So you're not conscious that in the deep of your personality you're trying to control other people, right? Or you're trying to manipulate other people. Right? But you are conscious that you're 
hand is aching, right? Or another example, you may feel your heart is aching. Your heart is aching, right? Your heart is aching or your heart is shattered or your heart is broken, right? So, you're suffering and you're conscious of this suffering, right? Or, let's say, you lied to someone. You lied to someone. Lie. You lied to your mother. She was asking you, where are you? Are you on your way to home? And you said, Yes, mom, I'm on my way to home, but not true. You're still sitting there with one of your friends playing video games and wasting time, right? So you lied to your mother and you are conscient of this lie. It's not like this. the lie is in your subconscious. It's not like the lie is here in the subconscious and you don't know yeah, I'm writing it like, like a diffused lie. It, but the lie is not there. It's not like it's a diffused lie that you don't know. You knew that it is wrong to lie to your mom, but you lied to her anyway. So it's in your conscience, right? So you have, in this case, examples of what is in your conscience, like hitting your hand having aching your heart or feeling sick or lying to your mom while you have also demons like manipulation or control to control other people and it's not so obvious that they, they are there, right? And this is like um, water, right? You have the surface and then you have the deeper parts of the water and you have the middle parts in the mar and then you have the water that is close to the surface, right? <coughs> now the deeper that the sin stronghold is, the harder it is to detect, right? So if the water of your conscience is clean, then you can see you can see to the ground. If it's clean, you can see, ah, there is a demon of control there. If this water is clean, right? But if the water is dirty, right? If the water is green and dirty, the water is like this, right? Then you can't see. If the water is like this, right? If the water is like this, you can't see what's beyond the surface, right? You can you see that your hand is aching, you're feeling that your heart is aching. And you know that there's something wrong when you lied to your mom, right? But you don't know the reasons, you don't know what's below the surface, you don't know what's going on in the subconscious, right? <clears throat> but when you seek Jesus and you're confessing your lies and you're confessing your wickedness and you keep on reading the Bible and you keep on fasting and you're living closer to the Lord, eating healthier, living healthier, stopping to sin, turning away from your sins and repenting and following Christ, then, then this uh, evilness gets every time um, look, uh, clearer, like the, your conscience gets clearer, right? 
the water of your subconsciousness gets clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer and all the muddiness and fussiness of the water gets away right and there you will be able to see all the wickedness that is going on in the lower parts of your conscience right all the monsters that are there trying to devour you right like manipulation or like pride lying suicide or whatever demon that is that tries to destroy your life you will be able to see it when you get rid of this turbiness of the water okay you see so basically your conscience is expanding from the obvious things like your hand that is aching and your heart that is aching or you have lied to your mother to becoming aware why you have lied to your mother why your hand is aching why is your heart broken why don't you have peace etc and then you may find out that there are those demons there that are becoming more and more exposed and you find, ah, there is manipulation in me, there is pride in me, there is a demon of suicide in me that is speaking into my mind, telling, kill yourself, Mandala, nobody cares about you, nobody cares if you are there or not, nobody loves you, you are useless, Mandala, or whatever it is, or a lying spirit that wants to express himself through my body, right? But, if your water is turby if your water is unclean then you can't see from your conscience to the subconscious and it lays in the subconscious it lays in the mar in the in the sea so i think that's enough for today i hope that was somehow edifying for you it's very important to keep on praying to the Lord that you may bring up anything in your conscience that needs to be exposed so you can see the demons that are in the deep in there and start fighting against them and live a holier life and of course that also helps you to be more free and to not fall for the demons and to make it into eternal life when your time on this earth runs up and Hopefully the Lord Jesus Christ finds you as a loyal servant when he finds you, when he comes back. So in that sense, I hope that helped. See you next time. Bye-bye. May Jesus bless you. Amen.